gotta wake up to a world that's real. You gotta rise up and make it feel. Life in full measure is more than just pleasure. Wake up and live. Hello, this is uh, Paul Sandhu. I want to introduce the program. My interview with this guest by the name of Mark Sargent. I want to have a little introduction to it before I, uh, you know, begin this program because the topic which uh, I was going to say is going to be a controversial one, but now I think the better word is that it is going to be a challenging one. This is a topic that really challenged me. Okay, I just came across it. Uh, well, I've came come across it many, many times in the past. But uh, like most of you, I always kind of put it in the back shelf, never really thought about it. Thought it was just, you know, uh, off the deep end and all that. But uh, about the, maybe a month ago, I'd say, I came across some videos on the on YouTube uh, by a person whose name is Mark Sargent. And this is the interview that I have done with Mark Sargent. And he speaks about the topic of the flat earth. Basically, the gist of the matter is that the, that, the, that the world that we live in, the earth that we live on, it is not actually a globe. And flat earth does not mean that it's like, uh, you know, the classical uh, misinformation that they tell us, you know, in the medieval times, they believed that it was a cube or something, you sail over the edge. That I also found out was not really the truth because people in the ancient world, they, they had a completely different view of the, of the earth as being a flat but not two-dimensional and certainly not being a cube. So that is something which I began to look at these videos. Uh, and then I did a lot more research. I read some books that uh, were written in the 19th century because in the 10th, 20th century, uh, you know, physics was co-opted by... Uh, anyhow, that's another story. So that we have now arrived at this model uh, with great opposition, I might add, that the Earth is actually a globe. Now, in this day, day and age, you know, we have spacecraft that are flying up there, the, you know, the space station. Just the other day, they said this was the 15th anniversary. And, uh, you know, they've been uh, flying there for 15 years now. We have the space shuttle, we have the moon missions. Uh, so, obviously, there's like, you know, millions of photographs of the Earth from space. And uh, everybody knows that it's a round ball. They, how can we even dispute that? But as they say, truth is actually many times, and in my experience, more times, stranger than fiction. And the truth about this whole thing is really, you know, it, it like hit me like a ton of bricks. It was like as if I was hit with a sledgehammer. And it is at the same time the most interesting information that I've ever come across. I think if you want to title this a conspiracy, which it definitely is, this would have to be the mother of all conspiracies. So folks, you know, what I'm going to do is I did a talk with Mark Sargent. I'll be having other guests on, on this topic and I'm going to do some of my own videos. So over time, you know, we're going to develop a little uh, like Sherlock Holmes. We're going to build a case. The case is going to prove that the world, that the earth that we live on, it is not a globe. It is not hanging in space. It is not spinning around madly. It is not traveling through this uh, through this uh, so-called space at like a, a you know breakneck speed, and it does not revolve around the sun. All these things are going to be proven. So what I ask is that you know please listen to the videos and see the view, the, the the proofs given very carefully. Examine them for yourself. Okay. I'm just going to give you what I think is the right conclusion based on the evidence that I have seen. Now you can examine the same evidence and come to your own conclusion. That is entirely up to you. But my challenge is that this is definitely the topic more than 9-11, more than the JFK assassination, more than you know Sandy Hook, Boston bombing, all those kind of things. They all pale in comparison to what this is. So please pay close attention this talk that I did with Mark Sargent is the first of many, like I said, but this is this was about two hours we talked. And I'm going to present it in three parts. I'm going to break it up, the whole talk. I'm not going to post the whole thing in one shot, but, uh, you know, so it'll be a talk between me and Mark. And then I'm going to also add some video clips. I'm going to present some other information that supports that which we were speaking about. So hold on to your hats. Let's go for a ride that I can assure you is going to be a wild one.
Thank you. This is Paul Sandu. Hello and welcome. Uh, today is Wednesday, November the 4th, 2015. This is Paul Sandu coming to you with another episode of Wake Up and Live Radio. Today I have on the line with me a new guest and a new topic, which I think is going to be, uh, well, some people might say that I've gone off the deep end. And that's what I used to say about everybody that uh, ever broached uh, with this subject with me, which is the topic of the flat earth. But I have been now studying this topic for not long, I'd say about a month or so, but I've done some lot of uh, research and study on it. And uh, I have to say that I am no longer convinced that we are actually living on a globe. So to give us some of his research that he has done quite extensively, and uh, he is a person that actually brought this to my attention through some of the videos that can be found on his channel. His name is Mark Sargent. He is on the west coast of uh, the North Pacific Northwest in Washington State. And uh, I will bring him on and then Mark can tell us a little bit about himself and his background. And then we will jump into this subject, which I'm sure is going to be controversial. But I just ask my listeners, you know, please uh, listen to this, weigh the evidence and then uh, make a decision if what is being presented is fact or if the fiction is that we live on a globe. Without further ado, Mark, welcome to the program. Hey, Paul. Thanks very, very much for having me. All right. So let's begin by, since you're a new guest to my show, let's uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself, about your background, and how you got involved in the subject of the flat earth. Sure. Uh, I was born in the Northwest, uh, raised raised right here, actually in Seattle, went out to Colorado to play video games for a living. Uh, it's about 20 years ago now and then taught proprietary software for a very long time out there and recently returned to the Northwest. But while I was out in Colorado, I started getting into, you know, because I was a big tech guy, a big nerd. So I spent a lot of the time on the internet. If you spend a lot of time on the internet, you're going to run into conspiracies here and there. It's just a natural thing. And I'd gotten in, I've delved in so many conspiracies, it started getting redundant. I was starting to circle around to the same ones and it wasn't really finding anything new. And then sometime last summer, this one kind of came across my desk. And I had heard about it before. Everybody's heard about this. It was just kind of this whisper. And it was called Flat Earth, you know, the whole Flat Earth theory. And for those of people that are listening out there who, you know, and you're wondering why you might be bracing against this, because everybody's first reaction should be either rolling your eyes, ridicule, snickering, laughing, you know, saying, oh, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. And I thought this too, and which is why I just kept ignoring it. It was like, yeah, cons- you know, conspiracy, conspiracy, going through them, going through them, flat earth. And I just kind of just toss it off to the side. And for the longest time, I didn't look at it. And then one day I caught this, just this glimmer, just because it was getting kind of tired of the old stuff. The, there was a video that came across from a German guy who was talking about the flight routes in the Southern Hemisphere. And I thought it was kind of interesting. I was going, huh, all right. But, but th- what made it different was you could actually look this stuff up now. So I kind of looked up the, the flights in the Southern Hemisphere, and it kind of makes sense. And then I ran it into Matt Boylan's video. If anyone doesn't know who Matt Boylan is, uh, his YouTube channel is called The NASA Channel. And he was a guy that claims basically that when he was 25, he, he was a subcontractor for NASA. And he went at, to a, to a high-level NASA party on the East Coast when he was, you know, some years ago. He's about thir- He's got to be pushing 38 now, but when he was 25, he went out to this high-level party. And they told him basically that the GPS system didn't work down in Antarctica because it was flat and he didn't get it. But it started to sink in after a while. That's the thing about the flat earth theory, which most people don't understand. Once it's in your head, it's, you know, once you look at it for even as little as 60 seconds, it's like a, a, a marble in a paint can. It's not coming out of there. So I tried to disprove it. And I worked on try. I started out as a debunker, like most people, which is why I do not get angry at people that say, oh, yeah, I can debunk this in two seconds. It's like, fine. I tried for nine months. And th- there was you know, a lot less material uh, you know, back last year on this. And I tried and I tried. And then finally, in February of this year, I just snapped. It was like I woke up in the middle of the night and I realized that I was going about this all the wrong way. I was like, you know what? 
forget about trying to disprove flat Earth. How do I know it's on a globe? How, you know, how, how do I know we're on a globe? And that's where I began my journey, and I started creating flat Earth clues. Okay, excellent. Yes, by the way, those are on your channel, uh, a series of videos titled Flat Earth Clues. Now, I just wanted to clarify that uh, when this term flat Earth is used, the image that comes into mind, which came into my mind all the time I heard this, is that, that the Earth is something like a cube, and, uh, you know, like it has a, a defined edge, and if you uh, go to the edge, you're going to sail right over it, right? And this, yep. is what, this is what everybody has ingrained into us, that that's what's meant by the flat earth, that that's what the medieval, that the medieval people are in the Middle Ages, that's what they believe. But when you do a little bit of research and uh, study this topic, then you find out that that is not what, is, what a flat earth actually means. Neither does it mean that it's two-dimensional. It just yeah. means that it's uh, not a round surface, that it is a plane. Yeah. Is, is that what's meant by flat earth? Yeah, yeah. Most people, again, that's part of the conditioning. Uh, everybody, the, the one of the first two reactions, when somebody hears flat earth, and you've got to wonder why everybody thinks this. When you hear this term, because I can talk to people all day long about the Truman Show or enclosed world or whatever, but if I say, and they, that doesn't bother them, but as soon as I say flat earth, people snap. They, they go into either archaic religious belief or really outdated science right. and that's the first two things they think oh well obviously the water it's a it's a plane and the water's falling off the edge and we all seen the movies from years and years ago you know the science fiction movies where a ship falls off the edge even even to the uh pirates of the caribbean even touches on it a little bit and that's not what it is the the flat earth is actually really just a, a like a giant version of the truman show where it's an enclosed in my model anyway it's an enclosed system where it's Literally kind of like a dinner plate with a big uh, ca glass cake thing over the top of it, where or a snow globe. I, I don't know how many have different references people need, but everything's in encased in it. So if you could, and which is why I put it on the channel and, and uh, the webpage and everything else, it's like the, the Truman Show from the movie, the Jim Carrey movie from 1998, was only, say, 20 miles wide. The concept I'm throwing out there is, look, if you could build that thing, several thousand miles wide could you fool an entire population an entire civilization that was inside it and the more i looked into to it the more i realized that not only is it possible to fool the population you know with the right reinforcements but likely it's probably already been done and the more i looked into it the more i realized that yeah it's probably been done and we seem to have discovered it back in the 1950s and the government decided they just weren't going to tell anybody Okay, you know, yes, you're right about uh, the emotional response. Like, you know, it, it was, it is, I must say personally, too, like this topic has been one that has hit me hardest than anything. Like, I've been uh, studying conspiracies for a good 20 years now, you know, from Kennedy to Lincoln and Lincoln to Kennedy to 9-11 uh, to even the moon hoax, uh, moon yeah. landing hoax and all that. I've, I've seen them all, okay? Yeah. There's pretty much the Jesuits, the Vatican, you know, you name it. I've, I, I have... Study them like yourself on the internet. Once you spend enough time, you come across them. But mm -hmm. this is the one that has generated an emotional response. And I thought about that. And I said, you know, why is it that people feel so strongly about this? I think this goes right to the, the, the core of our being as to who we are and what we are. And uh, it would put a whole different light on it if we understood that uh, as we have the world, as most of the civilizations believe that the earth was at the center of the universe and everything spun around it, it puts everything in a different light. It puts our whole existence in a different light. So let's yeah. get started. Uh, you, sure. so, so what you're saying is that the, 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 what you visualize is something like a flat surface and it is enclosed in a dome like structure like in that movie, The Truman Show. Yeah, okay. very, very much so. So we can approach this from two different angles. First of all, is like how do we actually know that we live in a globe? Mm -hmm. And secondly, what clues do we have that uh, that is not the case that the Earth is actually flat? That you can pretty much go from say one end to the other. And uh, biblically speaking, too, it talks about the four corners of the Earth. So there has to be some sort of reference there that uh, it's uh, you know the the edges or the the boundaries are defined. 
whereas on a globe you can't really do that. So, so where would you like to begin? Uh, well, let's start with, with that great question you had at the beginning, and that is, how do you know we're on a globe? Uh, that, that's the big mind bender. That's the mind bomb that eventually gets thrown into people's heads, which is, I ask you, whoever's listening out there, how do you know right now that you're on a globe? We all know, you know, because we equate being on a globe with all the other givens in our life. We know fire burns. We know water's wet. We can test all these things every day at any point. But how do you personally know you're on a globe? And people, it usually comes down to one of two answers. The first one is, which is a knee-jerk response, and almost everybody does it the first time. Well, we know. Obviously, we know. We, we science has, has told us that that we're on a globe. But it's obvious. I and I go, okay. Do you know because you remember seeing a model of a globe in the classroom ever since you were old enough to be in school, and that globe just stayed with you all the way until you left school, or do you know because NASA told you? Because that's usually the second response. Like, well, right. we've seen the picture. We, we've seen the picture. I'm going, okay. That's fine, but you're putting an awful lot of faith in one organization, the guys with the spaceships, to tell you exactly what the shape of the world is. And they say, well, you know, the, you know for the conspiracy people, they understand that, you know, that people will lie to you. Uh, when, if you're not a conspiracy person, like I wasn't years and years ago, it's like, well, the government would never lie to us. People would, the authority would never lie to us. I'm saying NASA isn't the benign science organization. They're not Star Trek. So you're putting a lot of faith in an organization that are a military wing of the United States government that was built from the ashes of the Nazi war machine. They do have the potential to do some sinister things. So once you can get past those two things, then I ask you the question again, how do you know the Earth is a globe without using the word NASA? And that's where it kind of started for me. I was like, how can I, I, that was, for me, it was, how can I myself prove the globe? And then I started looking into uh, this, this I, I started this journey of how I personally could prove the globe to myself. And the more I went down the road, the more I realized, once I started making the clues, and I made the clues fairly fast, that um, uh, I couldn't do it. There was, you, you'd think, because as you mentioned Every civilization, every tribe, every culture for the first 4,500 years of our civilization knew that it was flat. They were, in one way or another, it was a flat, enclosed system, either by the firmament, a canopy. Everybody's got their own version of this. Even tribes out in the middle of nowhere thought this. They thought, oh, yeah, the, sky, the stars are part of a big canopy. And you're thinking, well, that's just simple thinking. But then that changed 500 years ago, and that was where I looked. and was going, how did it change? Why did it change? And that's where the, my, my journey started. Okay. All right. So let's uh, go through some of these clues, I guess. Uh, sure. I'll leave it up to you what, you, where you, okay. what your number one, two, three clues will be. So let's uh, run down those clues. You bet. Uh, the, I started out fairly slow with the things that, you know, you've heard the same things that, you know, make you scratch your head, that make you go, hmm. And the first thing I started with, and I got some criticism for it because they said, oh, it's one of your weaker clues. And I go, no, it's not. It's one of those little tricky clues that you've got. You cannot dismiss it, which was the lack of any sort of fictional depiction of the Apollo program anywhere. And that is, you're thinking, what are you talking about? I'm going, okay. Name me, because I'm a big media junkie. I've digested a lot of media over the years. So Movies have I, and television. so have yeah. I, yeah. And I was realizing that, yeah, I've watched a lot of science fiction over the years. You know, everyone's watched science fiction. You know, Star Wars, Star Trek, Battlestar Galactica. It just goes on and on and on. Right. I go, and I thought, because, you know, Hollywood makes a lot of movies. And I said, okay, why has there never been a movie ever about a major motion picture even or even a straight D to DVD movie that has discussed the Apollo landings, that that is you know shown the, the actual Apollo program going there and people going, whoa, no, no, there's been movies made. I'm going, really, tell me what they are because I know them all. And there has only been two movies that have even scratched the surface. One was The Right Stuff in 1983, which was basically an astronaut recruiting program. It lasted three hours and made no sense. And the other one was Apollo 13, 1998, which that everyone knows, you know, from Apollo 8 through Apollo 17, 
uh, there was only one mission that even supposedly had trouble, and that was Apollo 13, you know, and they had, you know, had to kind of makeshift, do a MacGyver thing and, and come back home, but that was just shot in a capsule. Right. There's been no movie ever made about the Apollo program, and people said, well, that doesn't mean anything. No, no, I said, no, no, If there's a nickel to be made in Hollywood, they will make that movie. You can't tell me the greatest achievement in mankind, and they're not actually going to make a full-blown movie, and the reason is they can't. They can't because the production techniques that would be used by a Hollywood set are too close to what they use for the actual Apollo missions. And people don't know, I may be skirting the issue here, so I'll give it to you straight. Apollo and the moon program was completely falsified from day one. And I'll, I'll take it one step further. Not just the Apollo program. I mean, when ever anything that NASA has ever, ever done since their inception in 1958 has been an absolute fraud. They have done nothing. The only reason that place, the the NASA was, and I'll get to it a little bit later. The only reason NASA was even created was to help hide the structure that you're living in right now. So NASA, basically, what you're saying is uh, a Hollywood uh, movie production company. In basically, that's what they are, and they have made all these movies already, which is why the Hollywood that is on the West Coast is not allowed to make any this is something you know like when i saw this i thought about that when you mentioned it and i said yes uh this is the supposedly the greatest achievement uh, for america anyhow and perhaps <laughs> for mankind like neil armstrong you know one giant leap for mankind yeah. uh and you're right there you think that they would incorporate all that movie footage and you know they would they would make movies about neil armstrong dog or something even you know yeah. just to milk it and they have not exactly yeah, yeah. And, they... and not only that, like in in going on forty plus years now, they have not gone back to the moon. And this fiction that they have promoted is that it's because of budgetary reasons. Now, you know, I do a lot of finance programs, and I understand how the Federal Reserve works and how money is made and all that kind of stuff. I said, you know, if they wanted to, they could literally throw unlimited amounts of money at this. And you know, some private corporations like. I guess Hughes uh, Aerospace was big. Oh, yeah. Was there, right? Lockheed Martin, General yeah, right. Dynamics. Boeing, they would have jumped it. all over it, and they would have made hotels on the moon by now and everything else, uh, and none of that stuff happened. Like, in, from 1903 to 1943, look how far air travel went. You had yeah. jet aircraft. It was intercontinental travel. So in the last 40 years, nothing. So that yeah. is a big red flag for me. Yeah, yeah, it was a big red flag for me too, which is a, what, but it was kind of ambiguous. So I wanted to get it out there just to get people to kind of, you know, go down that road. But it, then I hit them with the big one, which was uh, the bird, the, the Admiral Bird. I did a clue called the Bird. Okay, who's, who's Admiral Bird? Admiral Richard E. Bird was probably the greatest United States Navy admiral of all time the the youngest not only was the youngest admiral ever he made admiral at age 41 which is unheard of so he's but, like the general macarthur or uh, yes Patton, yeah right? for, okay yeah he's like a macarthur a Patton, and eisenhower right. uh but he was also ex an explorer that was his big thing he was a big and an aviator so he flew his own planes he led his own missions and he was the guy you know if you went you wanted a guy to go to 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 search for something he was the guy so in 1926 everyone knows well a lot of people in the conspiracy world know the 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 story because it's like i've heard of admiral bird before and i kind of ran into him just kind of off chance because i was looking at the hollow earth theory which some people know and that is uh, that there's an opening at the north pole and there's this big cavern inside kind of during the center of the earth type thing and yes he actually went to the north pole in 1926 uh, by plane he flew around there and there's supposedly a secret diary of what happened but what was interesting was after 1926 he was recruited by what looked like the united states military or a higher group and he was sent to the south pole and from 1928 all the way up until uh really his death you know in 1957 he spent the remainder of his life looking for something at the south pole fully financed uh, one of the missions that he went down uh was in 1946 called operation high jump but from 1928 up into World War II, he was doing just missions, missions, missions down Antarctica, even though there's supposedly nothing down there for him to look at. I mean, you think it got kind of boring flying over ice right. and snow for year after year. And then the everyone took a break during World War II, except for one group. There was one group that was doing expeditions down to the South Pole. That was Nazi Germany, which I thought was interesting. And so at right after World War II ended, a big expedition called Operation High Jump, where he led an entire carrier fleet down to Antarctica, 
the rumor is to root out the last of the Nazis. Who knows what it was? But it's a great plot for a movie. I know that. But he took care of it. Whatever was going on in 1946, he took care of it. And then he kept doing more missions. And in 1954, and we're so lucky to have this footage, um, he goes on national television. He's between missions. So he do missions. And while he's prepping, he's got recon teams doing other things for him. He's going and doing tours around the United States and, and wherever he can do television uh, uh, interviews. And he gets on a show called The Long Jeans Chronoscope in 1954. And he gets on there and he's basically telling everybody that Antarctica is the most important continent in the world, not only scientifically, but it is a resource treasure trove. You know, it's got an entire mountain range made out of coal, it's got oil, it's got minerals, it's got uranium, and that all these countries are down there, they're going to carve this place up, you know, including countries that were rebuilding from the war, like the Soviet Union, like Great Britain, Argentina, New Zealand, Australia, Chile, take your pick, There's, they were all down there. And he was talking about the mission, the next mission that was coming up in 1955 to 1956 called Operation Deep Freeze. And he goes down there. And whatever he finds, and I have no doubt what he found, they were looking for it. And they found something. And whatever it was was so big, so draw, jaw-dropping that – Everything changed at that point. The world as we know it changed in 1956 because all the moves that were made after that were massive. They were decisive. They were multinational. And the first thing that happened was all those countries that were going to get all, make all that money because Antarctica was just made out of money left the ice at speed. And that was everybody got out of there at the same time. I've never seen a unilateral move like that made in the history of our world where all these countries that wanted the money, I mean, what, what, Conspiracy is bigger than money. And not only that, not only did they all leave, they all agreed and signed a treaty a few years later called the Antarctic Treaty to seal off Antarctica from any corporation from ever doing work down there, ever. And, and, and nobody really paid attention to it. It was, it was the most amazing thing. And it basically, if you're a country, and, and as countries became economically viable, they were told to sign this. That was one of the first things. It's like, oh, you're an economic power now? Here, sign this. Uh, what does it say? Oh, you can't do anything in Antarctica, ever. When's it up for re renegotiation? Oh, uh, 2041. It's like, who, 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 how does that even happen? So, so when, when was this treaty signed? Uh, 1959. 1959. So until 2041, they won't even yeah. look at this treaty. To, okay. Won't even look at it. And it's not like it's not one of those things where it says the general population can't go down there. You could go down there today. You could buy a plane ticket down there, take a tour. It costs about ten thousand dollars, and you could you know have a guide walk you around the outer islands, see some penguins and stuff like that. But when it comes to the interior, it's monitored. Uh, very, very closely. There is something, there's only like 5,000 people down there in Antarctica and most of it's military. Uh, there's something called the Antarctic Defense Force. You can look it up. It's real. It's a multinational Navy, state-of-the-art weapons technology. It monitors the coast. You can't, not only can you not get, uh, take a boat and go to the beach, you can't get, if you're in an unauthorized boat, you can't get within, from what I understand, like 500 miles of that place. And again, it's not that – it doesn't raise a lot of eyebrows because Antarctica is a very hostile climate. So what we're getting at here is with Antarctica is on a, on a globe, Antarctica is a big continent, a little bigger than, than – um, Australia. You know, it's a circular continent. We've all seen the picture, right? But on a flat world, Antarctica is not what you think it is. It is not this island continent. It actually gets stretched out to the outer edge. And so, because people say, well, when you get to the edge, what do you run into? And I say, you run into Antarctica. And Antarctica as a continent is so unique. It is slopes up from the beach, 150 to 200 feet of ice straight up. Right. And then it slopes up immediately after that and goes up to 10,000 feet and plateaus at 10,000 feet and stays at 10,000 feet until you get to a few mountains here and there. It is the most hostile place, way different than the North Pole, which is strange in, in its own right, where there's no indigenous plant life, no animal life, no, you know, no ancient cultures or populations like this. So, so why do you have an Antarctic Defense Force? Why do you have a treaty in place? What are you protecting? There's nothing there. Yeah, and, there's no there's no wildlife except for some penguins and seals, yes, et cetera, right? Yeah. But yeah. Uh, so you're saying there's no wildlife, there's no flora, there's uh, basically nothing there really except ice to defend. Yeah, 
And what I'm saying is, is that Admiral Byrd found what he was looking for for 30 years, whoever hired him to do it. Uh, and they almost gave up in 1954 because it was like, ah, well, if he hasn't found it in 20-something years, he's not going to find it now. And he did in Murphy's Law. But he found the edge, the barrier, something that indicated that there was an end to this world, an edge to this world. Mm -hmm. and, and at that point, that's when things started to change because the governments had to figure – had to make a decision real quick. And it's like, okay – how do we know what is the shape of our world? Because once you find, let's say, a barrier, a wall, whatever it is, something that stretches up as high as higher than the line of sight in all directions, what do you do? And that's where it got really, really fascinating because some of the nations, for example, Russia and America, which were the only two surviving technological companies or uh, countries at the time, companies, that's actually very closer to the truth. Mm -hmm. the, um, they started up in 1957 their rocket programs. Immediately, like their lives depended on it, which makes sense because you want to map this thing out. Yeah, fine, you could see what it what it ran left to right, but you don't know how high it is, and you don't know any arcs. Uh, Russians and the Americans start up their their rocket programs, and then immediately afterwards, we think it's the Cold War, but it's not. They're just trying to figure out what this thing is. They put atomic weapons on the top of those rockets immediately by 1958, and within the first three shots that America took. Uh, one of them, by the way, one of the packages the, of, of missiles that the Americans did w was called Operation Fishbowl, which doesn't make any sense from a naming standpoint. And it's like, why would you call it Operation Fishbowl if you're shooting rockets straight up? They formed NASA immediately in 1958. Why would you do this? Well, because you're going to want to control the exterior edge and the upper edge. And, and NASA was really just the militarization of space. And that it just got more and more interesting after that. For example, a year after NASA was formed, they announced the Van Allen radiation belts in 1959, saying, oh, yeah, by the way, it's the deadliest thing that ever. It's these huge bands of radiation. They just couldn't help themselves. The, the bands of radiation that surround the Earth, no one can go through them. Van Allen radiation belts were announced the same year that the Antarctic Treaty was put into place. Coincidence? No, of course not. You're sealing the upper edge and the outer edge at the same time. You're saying, oh, by the way, no one can go out there. And if you go up there high enough, you're going to die. So nobody should try. That knocks out all your major subcontractors, what you're talking about, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Hughes Aircraft. All those guys don't, you know, it's like, well, let's not, let's not bother with that. And the problem was, eventually, is that, and I'm going to steal this from Matt Boylan, which was eventually they have to take the picture, meaning they have to show people the globe in the classroom wasn't enough. The globe in the classroom only goes so far because sooner or later, people are saying, well, you have the technology to go up there, don't you? Why doesn't somebody take the picture? Well, the problem is, is that you, in order to even fake a picture like that, you can't just hand people pictures and say, right. you know, oh, but here's big, even if you could paint it because people are going to go, well, how'd you take it? You actually have to fake a space program just so you can give a reason that you that you fake the picture. So it's the most expensive picture of all time. And there was only one of them, and people don't don't realize that. But we, the, the Flat Earth Movement, totally caught on to that this year, which was they finally took a picture in 1972, which was... What you're talking last. about is the picture of the whole Earth as a globe. Yeah. That, that's whole, that's what we're talking about here. Yeah, that, yeah. The, that And the, that there's only one picture that they claim... Yep. is the globe and uh, that will come as a surprise to most people assured it for me that yeah. in all these years years of space travel and they got probes going up to mars and now this cassini probe is going by saturn and everything else and you got pictures coming you know air from every direction and and yet there's only one picture of the globe yeah yeah, in fact, when... You Can know, you elaborate people, that on a little bit more so oh, my audience understands it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, the, from Apollo 8, if you believe what NASA tells you, from Apollo 8, and that's, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, that's a bunch of missions. From Apollo 8 to Apollo 17, they were supposedly going all the way to the moon and back. Yes. Right? And they didn't even... Take a, I mean, talk about dragging your feet. They didn't even take a full picture of the globe lit from the sun until Apollo 17, the last mission, and it's on the way back. It's like, oh, by the way, since this is going to be, and they told people, it's like, oh, Apollo 17 is going to be the last one for a while, so, for no apparent reason. It was like, oh, yeah, we're bored with the moon, whatever. And so when they come back from Apollo 17, they snap a single shot. Right. 
And that's the one, and we all know it. If you're, if you're curious, I mean, it's, it's a little tougher to find now. But um, it's a single shot that basically showing the bottom part of the, the entire continent of Africa and the part of, uh, and, 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 all of Ant- and all of Antarctica. Right. And for a while I thought, wow, that's interesting. It's an American program. Why wouldn't you take a picture of the United States? Isn't that the whole point? It's like, why would you show Africa, which nobody even nobody would know what was going on there anyway, at the time, and all of Antarctica? And that's because they wanted to kill two birds with one stone. Let's show the Earth as a whole and Antarctica so we can show people these two things, showing, oh, this is what Antarctica looks like and the Earth as a globe. And that was literally the only picture. And you, you can look this up now. It's not hard to find the, the story. And that is that was the only picture, full-blown picture, release of the Earth from 1972 all the way until July of this year, July of 2015. And that's when it got interesting because July, because we were talking about this all the way in February. It's like there's only one picture of the Earth. Right. Nobody, all these satellites, all these probes flying around, all these corporate satellites, nobody, no geosynchronous uh, uh, group is going to take a picture of the Earth? Are you kidding me? It's, it's impossible, but that's what they passed off. Uh, in fact, I knew this because in 2000, when I was looking for desktop backgrounds for my tech support department, I was typing in a search engine. I was going, pictures of the Earth from space. And uh, uh, it, it, I just got rows and rows and rows of exactly the same picture in just different resolutions, and I couldn't understand it. And I was, I was looking, I, I was so angry. Of course, I was naive in 2000. I was going, you know, NASA, you suck. And it's like I just decided to use another picture. And even like the, the guy that made the first uh, globe thing, for people who remember the first iPhone, uh, you know, the globe that's on the iPhone, right. he had to actually create that from a composite image because there was no, no decent reference. He did the same thing I did. And he's like, you can't find any good pictures of the globe. So we started pushing that at the beginning of this year. And then miraculously, uh, in July of this year, NASA releases a brand new photo of the Earth. And they actually said that it, they bothered to put that in the story. Oh, yeah, by the way, this is the first photo we've taken of the Earth in 43 years. It's like, why would you tell people this? Why would you not just release the photo? The White House tweeted this thing. You know, it was just, just mind-blowing to me. So, yeah, uh, there's that was, that was one of my big things. Why are there no pictures of the Earth from space? Yeah, there are some now, they claim, are from the Earth from space. But for 40 three years they didn't have any and they only released them because the the conspiracy world was saying where are the pictures of the earth so and and they're all composites they're all fake even they said in the picture they released oh yeah by the way it's a composite image and people don't know what a composite image is it's a collection of other images that you put together with photoshop that uh that looks like the real thing you know that looks like what you would think so what they're it, saying is these satellites are flying past this supposedly round globe and they're taking pictures of each section because it can't take the whole thing. So yeah. then somebody sits down in Photoshop and pieces all these pieces together and makes the full picture. That's yeah. what these composites are. So so everything that we are seeing, so would that still be true that it is still that Apollo 17 shot that was one picture yeah. of the whole globe? Everything else is still a composite? Yeah, yeah. Everything else is still a composite. There's still no so single shot. So you could shot. literally take pictures of the flat Earth section by section by section, and then make it into yeah. a globe. Could you not? Yeah. Oh could yeah, you, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You could. Right. Uh, it, and it's just oh, and just all the other things about. I mean, the Apollo program. That's the first thing that people have to give up. Unfortunately, I know there's a lot of people who say, no, no, America went to the moon. I was like, really? Because the the footage that's out there, all the pictures that they had is really, really dated. It did not age well. And they did not know that the internet was going to be out you know, years later and people are going to start sharing information. Uh, and I released some, some really valid points that other people had brought up. One was, why has there never been ever an exterior panning shot taken from an astronaut with a camera on any mission, on anything, space shuttle, space station, exterior shot, where all they do is turn around even 180 degrees with the camera running. No one's ever done that. What, at them on the moon, you're not going to take the camera and just do a quick 360 ever, and you you or or why did why did the Russians never complete? I mean, the Russians were ahead of us supposedly in the space program, right. and then once America gets to the moon, they just quit. They just stop going. It's like, oh, well, they got there first. It's like it's like a it's it's like America. It's not. 
in any sporting event do you ever see this like what they the other guy just doesn't finish like a marathon race the other guy well that guy got there first i'm just gonna stop running and go get coffee that doesn't make sense they they shut down most of their moon program and said okay we're gonna do some space shuttles and stuff like that no no, it had nothing to do with that. They knew that we were we had better special effects people. We had better directors. Stanley Kubrick was tied to this thing. We we all knew this. I mean, 2001: A Space Odyssey, which he he built from 1963 to 1968, he was hired, but he was paid by the United States government to make that movie. Everyone knows this. It, it, no one let somebody take five years to make a movie in the right. '60s, right. and then and then they said, "Oh yeah, by the way, the research that you did, if you want to turn it into a movie, go ahead." Oh yeah, here you go, best picture. Well, but what I what I have read is that that while he was making that movie, that's a, the a parallel filming was they were doing the Apollo program movie yeah. at the same time, so that was a cover. Yeah. And now yeah. this also raises an interesting point about what you talk about movies. Two thousand and one was such a big hit. Yeah. You think that you know a year later they go to the moon that the whole seventies decade should have been moon movies because everybody was into this, right? Yeah, yeah. And the only movie that really touched on the space program in the nineteen seventies, glad you brought that up, was Capricorn One. Right. And Capricorn One, which was not made by a studio, studios weren't allowed to. It was an independent film made by a, an ex CBS television producer and he and he watched the moon movies through his tele you know because he was uh, rebroadcasting the the moon footage he's going oh, this production value is terrible I could make something better than this and so we did he went out and made Capricorn one which interesting enough kind of parallels them today how to fake a Mars mission right. and why why you would fake it and the processes involved he basically went from a to Z and I think he realized as he was ma- as helping make this movie it's like you know what you know, because that's the problem. If you start making a movie about it, the, you're going to start seeing it's like, you know, that looks – stuff we're making, you know, on the Hollywood set, that looks a lot like what actually happened. And we're just using, you know, props. So the question is it blurs the line. It's like how do we know it? what's a movie – if you put it side by side, what's a movie and what's not a movie? And Capricorn 1, if anyone wants to watch an interesting, interesting movie about – how to fake a program? That's that's the one, and it'll never be remade. I guarantee you that, and it, which is why all the, you know we've never even seen a fake film like that ever again. I think they're kind of regretting the fact they let that thing even get out. It made it was the best uh, highest grossing independent film of the year. O.J. Simpson was in it. Yeah, yeah, O.J. Simpson. Yeah, yeah. By James, the way, that Peter Peter Hyams who made that movie, he also made some other. He made one called Telephone. With Charles Bronson, which is also another interesting movie because it talks about how the, the the CIA, whatever their mind control programs, and how they, it's the Manchurian candidates, you know. So I mean, this guy obviously had some insider information to make movies like this. Was was that the one where he ended up tearing up his entire apartment? No, no, no. Okay. This this is just they have these Manchurian candidates, oh, you know, on the it. telephone. They, the signal is sent, and then they go on a rampage or whatever. It was a pretty oh. like, and it was a B movie, but the idea behind it was very good, and it's made by the same guy. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I'm sorry, I was getting kind of, I was going in several different directions there, but uh, the, the looking into Admiral Byrd and Antarctica really was my turning point for me because it started to scream structure. And that was why would if you if they had sealed off just the outer edge, and maybe then a couple of years later maybe dealt with the space stuff. No, but they did it both at the same time. It was like they're very and they spent a lot of money doing it. But the summary, what I'm saying here is, it looked like the United States government and the and the Russians, so the United States and the Soviet Union back in the 1950s figured out what our world really looked like. And they decided, which comes back to the question I asked, if you found out, if you've been passing off this globe for hundreds of years and you actually went up high enough to take, you know, to figure out what this world looked like and it didn't look like a globe, would you tell the population? Would you tell people? And the answer was fairly quickly, no, no, you wouldn't. Uh, Not if you want to keep any sort of power structure that you're already into at the the point because it's all about control. And they probably thought, you know what, we could probably bounce back from this. It could take 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, maybe, but it would be, it's an unknown. There's an unknown factor here, which is uh, because people say, why does it matter? You know, if it's round or flat, I love it when people say that. I mean, and I get, believe it or not, say 5% of my questions are, is that very question? And it's like, look, you're not thinking big enough. You're not, you're not thinking out of the box. It's not a big deal until it is, which is, yeah, fine. You have to get up and go to work tomorrow. But 
that everything about that, everything about that perspective changes, which is basically what I'm saying is if it's if it's a globe, then fine, you're just a rock flying through space and you're insignificant, you're part of billions of other galaxies. But if it's an enclosed structure, everything becomes way, way more intimate. And not only that, the first question that, that will be in everybody's mind is who built it? Right. Who built this thing? And even if you don't know exactly who built it, you have almost irrefutable evidence that there's a handprint of someone that built it. Now, I, am I saying it's the divine? Eh, maybe. I mean, 80% of the population in this world does fall into some religious category. Uh, am I saying it's an advanced civilization? Did God subcontract this thing out? We don't know, but whoever they are, they're a lot bigger and powerful and more powerful and older than we are. And a lot of people are going to say, look, it's proof of the divine. It's proof of creation. I am in, I fall into that camp, definitely. When that happens, or if, you know, for me it's when, uh, it's, uh, some people say, no, it's an if. Once that happens, things, things change overnight, which is science really starts backpedaling in a hurry. Because think about it, if you're if you're into astrophysics or, or astronomy, uh, you got to shut down those things tomorrow. You know, NASA closes tomorrow. Every university in every country has to basically retool every science department: uh, geology, hydrology, geography, archaeology. Take your pick. They all have to retool to this new thing. And astrophysics and astronomy, yeah, those those just close down. You, those those books go to the recycle bin because the, that's that's all fabrication. On top of that, all the religious houses, and by that the big five, uh, uh, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity, they all will turn and say, well, we, are, we knew this for a long, long time, and science has been beating us over the head for the last few centuries, uh, and we're, you know, we, we never forgot about this. And so the, there's a big paradigm shift. And for anyone, you're, you're talking about science organizations that discovered it. <laughs> So what do you think? They're going to fire themselves? No, of course not. It behooves them not to do anything. It's like so, you know so what, what you're saying is there's too many people with a vested interest that would like yes. to not just uh, the people who know, but even the ones that may not know, even if they're suspected because their paycheck depends on it. If you are a professor of astrophysics at Harvard or something, you know it, it would be in your interest to keep this under wraps. Oh, yeah, you have to if, if you're if – you're, yeah, the, the power str- – and even if you're not a scientist, a government oh, – think of the defense industry mm. because, because if we become – here's where things can change. It's like why does it matter? It's like, well, because we become way more of a community, more of a village, more of a family. Our, the, the whole art of war changes because really you're going to go to war if you guys are all kind of in the same boat so to speak uh what happens to the defense contractors you know there's there's com- co- corporations out there that would have big ones that would have to retool for for peacetime um crime rates uh, how we think about each other uh everything from uh you know racism to sexism to uh, in any of your major capital crimes because we become more accountable. And that is, uh, let me be plain, if there is proof of intelligence design, if there is a creator, then are we being watched? Are we, you know, is there a scorecard on our lives? And if there is, how is everybody... a man shall sow, that shall he also reap. So basically you're saying to say we have to have accountability for yeah. our actions to somebody other than just man. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah. It, I mean, it become we become responsible for right. our own, own actions, and I thought that was that was one of the things that really drew me into this. It's like wow, and because I touched on this in one of the clues, which was uh, um, one of the later clues, which talked about the astronauts. It was an interesting program. If anyone hasn't seen it, uh, from a 2004 documentary called uh, "Astronauts Gone Wild." Right. And I thought that one bugged me. I, well, uh, let me do two parts here. The first part, uh, this this kind of answered an old question for me, which was why would because everyone has heard about the Apollo missions and and the moon missions. It's like why would you fake the moon missions? And that bugged me. It's like why would you fake the moon missions? It doesn't make any sense. It's like fine, we put an American flag up there, and make America look really good. Is that really worth you know a trillion in adjusted dollars? Eh, I don't know if you're getting the, that much out of it, but. If it's an enclosed system, then it becomes – it's not a question anymore. It's a statement, which is it's not that they 
wanted to fake it. They had to fake it. If you don't fake the space program, you're risking the private corporations getting involved. You know, it's a combination of, you know, General Dynamics team, teaming up with Frito-Lay. And eventually somebody's going to go there and plant a big corporate banner on there, you know, which, which takes me into a whole other thing. Uh, but I got to mention that real quick, which is uh, the Chinese supposedly have a, a, a moon rover right now. On the moon. Supposedly he's been there since 2013. Been running around there for two years, just like the Mars rover. They send any pictures back. You think they go to the Sea of Tranquility, take pictures of the American flag, pulled up some sort of Chinese symbol somewhere. No, nothing's being rebroadcast, even though it's supposedly working, functioning fine. Look it up. It's supposedly there right now. Nobody's talking about it. Oh, and then the Mars rover that's uh, been running now, even though the battery life should have been expired years and years ago. It's still running perfectly fine. No, no mechanical problems. It's just tooling around probably in the Arizona or New Mexico desert, but that's a whole nother thing. Uh, so where was I going with this? Well, you were uh, talking about, uh, you know, basically the motivation behind uh, the uh, faking it, that they had to fake it. There wasn't yeah. just an option. Yeah. You, you had to, f you, you had to fake the, the moon landing. And I, I lost my other train of thought, but I'll, I'll, I'll come back to it eventually. Well, which, while you're on this topic, you know, like yeah. yesterday, by the way, was the anniversary yesterday or the day before that the space, the space station, so-called international space station has been up there for 15 years. Okay. And, mm -hmm. and everybody released a bunch of pictures that they've taken over the years. And one of the things that's the commonality between that and the Apollo photos and everything is that space is always black. Okay. That yeah. there is, there are no stars. Yeah. Except I saw one photo in which uh, was obviously looked like photoshops. They show this, uh, the space shuttle hanging upside down with this cargo bay doors open and blah, blah. And then you see, oh, it was taken at night and it was beautiful stars in the background. Okay. So that was a shot. So it looks like somebody took a picture of the sky, pasted the space shuttle on top and that's, but every other picture was black. There's no stars. Even yeah. at nighttime, they show this picture of the moon rising one, one photo, beautiful photograph, which, by the way, because it slanted at a certain angle, was trying to create the illusion of a curve on the horizon. But when yeah. I, I took that photo, I flipped it over, and the horizon is absolutely flat. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. But there are no stars. And this was a problem with the Apollo uh, missions, wasn't it? With the yeah, astronauts. yeah, you can't if you're going to fake something. And I remembered uh, um, what I was going to talk about was astronauts gone wild. Let me let me let me mention that real quick, and I'll go into the stars thing because otherwise I'll forget it because it's early. The um, the astronauts wild thing really bugged me because they when he was interviewed when when all the astronauts were interviewed uh, by this one journalist who was just kind of an, a jerk but uh which is probably why he won't talk to me when i say things like that because <laughs> he ambushed him and he was trying to like trip him up with multiple questions and he thought of something it's like well, you know what i'm just going to bring out a, a king james bible and have him swear on it real quick and say hey by the way swear that you went to the moon and no one would do it and that really bugged me that stuck in my head for a while because it didn't make any sense i was like why would they care why would they care were they strong christians are they boy scouts why would they not swear in the bible people lie under oath all the time it's called perjury we have an entire legal system that deals with crap like that and they wouldn't do it i was going wait and once i got into the enclosed world though then it made way more sense because i was going oh i get it because when you're swearing on something like that you're not swearing on the bible it didn't have to be a bible you're swearing if you know, because I have no doubt the Apollo astronauts knew that they were told why they were going to be faking this, and they don't tell astronauts anymore. They just tell them you're faking it and you're not doing have clearance. But with the Apollo astronauts, they told them, and they realized, like, you know what, I'm, they, they're not going to do anything malicious again ever in their lives, including lying. And most of them became recluses. You would think that, you know, ticker tape parades and they'd be super happy. Look at the press conference after that, uh, that first big moon mission where they were sitting there in front of the International Press Corps. They, you'd think these guys would be just glowing with, you know, with basking in their own glory. And they looked like – I've never seen men that were that down. It's because they were faking something too big. Right. But to get to your star's point, yes, faking the moon mission – uh, that was that was a problem because you can't. The computer technology wasn't available then. Now we could do it if we wanted to because you can get the constellations. Here's the problem: if the stars aren't in the exact right place at the right time, if you take a picture and you stamp it, someone eventually is going to figure it out. Some math geek is going to figure it out it's okay if the moon's here, the Earth's here, stars are in that corner, and they're going to basically make it match up the time, the date, time stamp. Right. 
with the star. So if the if the if the belt of Orion is over the astronaut's shoulder in this picture and it's not supposed to be, someone's gonna figure that out. And that is way too hard mathematically, especially in the 60s, to try to fake that. Because you oh, it would be so hard to to do even the major constellations behind them and get them all in the right place at the right time. No. So they just said, you know what, we're not we're not gonna deal with it at all. We're just going to have no stars in any shot, which was an ad that was asked by the International Press Corps and uh, Neil Armstrong, if I'm not mistaken, uh, almost caught himself on that because he was like wavering. He's like, oh, I don't remember seeing any. And the other two guys were like, oh, no, no, there were no stars. <sighs> They're looking at him like, dude, How do is not- that possible that there are no stars? That that just is something which you know, boggles my mind. It's it's. Yeah. They tell us, you know, you, you should see it much more spectacularly out there because there's no yeah. light pollution. There's uh, It's just the blackness of space. Any source of illumination would be probably 10 times brighter than we see on Earth. Yeah. Uh, no yeah. stars. This is the end of part one of this interview. I am uh, closing this part off with some clips that uh, are relevant to the subject that we're speaking about, uh, about the moon hoax, uh, you know, not having pictures from space, etc. And then I'll be posting part two in the next couple of days. Thanks for listening. This is Paul Sandhu. This very first, first clip that I've included here is about the history of Nats, NASA. I almost said Nazi, and there's a reason for that, because NASA is essentially a Nazi organization. Despite uh, all the history books that we have read, the reality is that the Nazis did not lose the Second World War. The Germans lost the war, but not the Nazis. The Nazis just packed their bags and they moved to the U.S., Canada, Britain, Australia, Russia, and into all the prominent countries of the world. They are in charge of uh, all the major, you know, significant organizations such as NASA, such as the CIA, and they have their tentacles in the Defense Department all over. They have, they control industries such as like the Airbus industry. So yes, the Nazis did not lose the war, they won it. So, so this is something that most people do not understand, that NASA is, was and is essentially a Nazi organization. I'm going to step off the limb. That's one small step for man. If we really want to understand what's going on in space today and what's happening with the plan to put weapons in space, I think it's instructive to go back and understand the origins of the U.S. space program. And to do that, you have to go back to Nazi Germany. Hitler recruited a brilliant young rocket scientist by the name of Werner von Braun, who had a weekend rocket club to come to work for the Nazis to build the V-1 and V-2 rockets that were used to terrorize the cities of London and Paris and Brussels towards the end of World War II. Well, you know, immediately after the war, the U.S. and the Allies created the Nuremberg Trials, at which time we brought the Nazis to justice for their crimes against humanity. But 1,500 of the top Nazis never went to trial. They were smuggled into the United States by the U.S. military in a, under a program called Operation Paperclip, smuggled in through Boston and West Palm Beach, Florida. And Werner von Braun and his rocket team, a hundred of them, along with 100 copies of the V-2 rocket, were sent to Huntsville, Alabama, where von Braun became the first director of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. What's interesting is the other 1,400 Nazis, who were they? Well, some of them were brought to the United States to work for the CIA. Others were brought to the United States to do the LSD drug experiments and the MK Ultra mind experiments during the 1960s where people were jumping out of windows. Some of the uh, Nazi scientists that in Germany had been taking Jews and putting them in freezing temperatures to see how the body would react to that were sent to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio and were put in charge of the U.S. military flight medicine program. 
And so when you uh, take 1,500 of the top Nazi scientists and essentially seed the military industrial complex, the question I have is, do they bring with them an ideological contamination? Well, not only did Von Braun go to work for NASA, but the guy that was in charge of the V-2 flight test program up at Pinamundi along the Baltic Sea, a guy by the name of Kurt Debus, became the first director of the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And then the man that recruited Von Braun, Major General Walter Dornberger, the guy that was sent by uh, Hitler to recruit Von Braun to come to work for the Nazis, he became vice president of Bell Aerosystems Corporation in New York that made its riches building the helicopters for the war in Vietnam. <laughs> Okay, the next clip is the 1954 interview on CBS television with Admiral Richard E. Byrd, who is probably the most famous Navy man in U.S. history, and he spent more time down in the southern parts of the earth than probably any man ever. Okay, now in this interview, Admiral Byrd claims that, you know, Antarctica is a great rich resource, rich land that is going to be absolutely mined and uh, essentially exploited by all the powers that be. And that expedition after expedition was planned on an annual basis to go down there and to search it out and to start uh, claiming some of these, uh, some of the wealth that was down there and to claim the land, of course, for the United States and all the other nations that were uh, staking a claim down there. But Surprisingly, a few years later, two, three, four years later, uh, the, the ice curtain came down. Like the Iron Curtain came down after the Second World War, which was another, uh, you know, uh, anyhow, the, uh, so the Iron Curtain, the ice curtain came down on Antarctica, and uh, basically all the nations, the major nations of the world signed treaty. Okay, our Antarctica is off, off limits. Nobody goes down there, nobody exploits, nobody mines, nobody brings out any resources. So that made a lie out of everything that Admiral Byrd had been doing for years and years down there and the plans that had been formulated until then. What happened? Why was Antarctica locked down tighter than Fort Knox? If there's something down there that uh, made this happen, people say it's aliens, it's, it's you know, this, that, some other civilization down there, or perhaps there really is an ice wall that, that uh, is the boundary of the earth, and it would make a lie out of all the astronomy and all of the physics of the last, you know, 500 years, and uh, that perhaps is the real reason why Antarctica is now literally no man's land. Larry Lasseur, CBS News correspondent, and Kenneth Crawford, National Affairs Editor of Newsweek magazine. Our very distinguished guest for this evening is Admiral Richard E. Byrd. The North Pole used to be a no man's land, but uh, these are the days when by buying a ticket on a commercial airliner you can fly across the North Pole and drink a cocktail at the same time. Yet only three score or more years ago, about 35 years ago, our guest tonight found out whether there was any land north of the North American continent. He made that first discovery flight, and I must say that Admiral Byrd, our guest tonight, is not only our greatest living explorer, but he's been an inspiration to countless Americans. Admiral Byrd, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any unexplored land left on this earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. And not up around the North Pole, because it's getting crowded up there now, because they find out it's really usable, not only to live in, but militarily. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from Middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that, unexplored. Well, this is a tremendous So challenge. there's a lot of adventure left mm. down at the bottom of the world. Well, Admiral, do you hope to see that? I do. 
Well, Admiral, yes. would you say that uh, since you've been to both the extremities of Earth, are these expeditions to such far off places, are they getting easier because of modern techniques or is, still, is danger still close at hand? Well, it's a little risky, but nothing like it used to be with the old slow planes and the small cruising radius where we had to put down bases. We replaced the dog teams, and of course that was a big improvement. But now the planes go much faster, and they are safer, and they have a much bigger cruising radius. You haven't got the danger of a terribly heavy load. Mm -hmm. Admiral, a, an expedition to which I believe you're the advisor is now en route. Uh, what is that expedition doing? Well, that's the icebreaker ATCA, and it's a reconnaissance expedition. It's going down to the South Pole area to make certain observations and to, to look for some bases. They will be back in April, and they will report back, and upon the information we get from that undertaking, uh, we will base the bigger expedition that's to follow. Uh, is that very definitely planned, or uh, is that... Uh, that is being planned right now. So I'm willing to say to you that uh, there will be a number of expeditions that will follow, I think, uh, year after year bottom of the world because the government has really become interested. Yeah, I just uh, paused that interview there because I want you to pay attention to what he was saying, that expedition after that Richard uh, Admiral Byrd was saying, expedition after expedition will follow, and uh, they were planning bigger and bigger expeditions because the government had become really interested. But at that point in time, the interest was in, uh, in securing or claiming this land for the United States and also to exploit all the resources that were down there. However, in, like I said, in a few years down the road, four or five years down the road, this whole thing changed. The Antarctic Treaty was signed. And now, since then, and this treaty was is in effect until 2041. So in 1959, they decided that until 2041, no one would be allowed to to do any type of uh, commerce down there, or even, you know, exploration. Exploration, really. Yes, they have the McMurdo and all those uh, places down there, but they're really on the edge of Antarctica. They're not in the interior, far in the interior. So all this changed in 1959 or in 1956, actually, a couple of years after that. Well, Admiral Byrd, I can understand, I think everybody can, the interest in the North Pole because it's so near our greatest challenger, Soviet Russia. But why this interest in the bottom of the world? Nobody living down there, is there? No, it's, um, it's pretty cold. There's only one permanent resident, that's the Emperor Penguin. The little ones live further north. I tell you one reason they're interested. It's by far the most... Uh, valuable, important place left in the world for science. That's why the scientific groups all over the nation are really interested. So again, there's a lot of information in, uh, in this little clip, so I want to pause it once more. What he said was that this Antarctica was the most important place on the earth for science. Okay? This scientific inquiry is actually been going on since the 18th, 19th centuries when observations were made, even by people like Captain Cook, that the southern latitudes behaved entirely differently than the northern ones. For example, like, you know, uh, if you go to the same latitude south as Iceland, it is a complete barren wasteland. Captain Cook wrote that there was not even so much as a single uh, you know, a piece of wood to make a, even a toothpick. Okay, so this problem that the South Pole, if the Earth is truly a globe, and the South Pole is basically a mirror image of the North, then the conditions on both poles should be very, very similar. As for example, right around the equator, they say, you know, like the country is just north of the equator and south of the equator, they're pretty similar there, but not so in the case of the poles. Okay, they are worlds apart let's say, okay, for example, the North Pole, in comparison to the South, you could say is, is much more temperate, and the life, uh, you know, uh, animal life, plant life, etc., it's, it's on a completely different scale than in the South, and this is something which scientific inquiry has been going on for quite some time as to why this 
unprecedented difference between the southern latitudes and the north. And you said, you know, the only one that can live on the interior was the penguin, was the emperor penguin. Not even the little penguins can survive down there. Whereas at the North Pole, we have uh, like the polar bears, seals, all kinds of animals. As soon as summer comes, you know, it literally turns into a paradise down there. No such thing happens in the South. So this difference, is it because, uh, what is the real reason for it? That is a good line of scientific inquiry. But again, that is something that has been either shut down or if it is being looked into, we are not privy to those results. But more important than that, it's, uh, it has to do with the future uh, of the nation, those to come after us, or even uh, during your lifetime. Because it happens to be an untouched reservoir of natural resources. And, uh, you know, as the world swings with an ever-increasing acceleration, far-flung places, once useless, like we thought the North Pole was, and no man's land, become very useful. Uh, the bottom of the world will be important, not only to us, but to our allies. Uh, does it, I was going to ask you, does it have military importance? Uh, it has some, and uh, as the world shrinks, it will continue to shrink with an ever-increasing acceleration, thus bringing these places closer. And in the future, I can see a time when it will be very, very important strategically. Well, has the development and, and of air power increased their, the strategic importance of places like the uh, oh, very much Palmer so. Peninsula? Was uh, very much so. Even now, if uh, anything happened and we uh, lost the Panama Canal, we would have to control the islands just north of Antarctica, which are part of Antarctica, and between there and Cape Horn. I'm going to... Uh include one more clip here and then I'm going to end this part. And this clip is about how NASA quote-unquote accidentally taped over the Apollo 11 videotapes. And if you can believe that, then uh, I do have some prime oceanfront property for you in Arizona that I can sell you cheap. How ridiculous is that, that this is the excuse that they come up with, that the Apollo 11, the most significant event in the 20th century, if not in the history of man, about the man going to the moon, and they taped over those videotapes. Do you not think that in that day and age when everything records were kept like so meticulously about everything they had the national archives at the smithsonian libraries presidential libraries everywhere these records of significant events were kept and preserved very 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 carefully and this event which is the most important event of all history of man was taped over by NASA. Okay. What all this has to do with the Apollo program, the what's, what's happening in Antarctica, Antarctica and what has happened, uh, what the significance of that is, what is the significance of the current space program, the space shuttle program, etc. I'll tie all this together. You know, there have been uh, some... Uh, uh, of the significance has been alluded to in this uh, part one of this series, but uh, I will elaborate that even more in the next uh, next segment of this. Uh, so, uh, well, that's something to uh, for you uh, to think about and to perhaps look forward to. So please uh, stay tuned. Why did NASA feel it necessary, ladies and gentlemen, to fake pictures and lie to us as early as July 1966? The moon landing. We were there on the surface of another planet. You could see it on TV. Well, first it was projected onto a silver screen and then the TV cameras were allowed to film off the silver screen because obviously you wouldn't want the real footage. I mean, if you want to go back and look at the real footage of the initial moon landing, you can't because it's been taped over by NASA and no one was fired, no one was punished. Of course, they want to get rid of the evidence. 
Now at this stage, a band of Apollo faithful will be howling in protest, we did go to the moon. Then why did nothing come of it? Why have we not been back in 40 years? The Apollo faithful will say, oh, it's budget priorities, we've been there, we've done that, it's not economical to mine on the moon. That just doesn't hold water, that's a load of rubbish. We haven't been back to the moon because we never went there in the first place. In the year 1994, I read a book by Ralph René which suggested just such a thing, that the entire moon landing had been a hoax. This is the reason why we don't have a moon base now, why we aren't mining on the moon. Werner von Braun promised a moon base by the 1980s. Actually, before I finish off, I just want to include one more short clip, which is from uh, Stanley Kubrick's 1980 movie, The Shining. Stanley Kubrick has been very closely associated with the Apollo program. He made that famous movie, 2001, The Space Odyssey, which is probably, with Star Wars, uh, the most famous uh, space movie ever made. And uh, he was rumored for a long time to have been the man behind the faking of the Apollo missions. And apparently, the night in this movie, The Shining, he included, uh, well, he made a confession, basically. And this short clip that I'm going to play here, I'm going to tell you what I see in it and why I believe this is exactly what Stanley Kubrick was pointing to was these fake moon missions. Okay, this is a scene from the movie The Shining, which came out in 1980 with Jack Nicholson. And uh, this in this scene here, which uh, was very, very, uh, in, in which, you know, Stanley Kubrick focused on certain things, to uh, basically bring them to our attention. Otherwise, you know, why would he, he was very, he was a very, very, uh, did, did things very deliberately in his movies. He set up his shots. Uh, sometimes he took like 50 takes, you know, so he was a very, very meticulous director. So in this scene here, there's a little boy, Danny, who, by the way, has an imaginary friend in the movie. So he's got all these little toy cars and trucks, etc. okay? So what's, uh, what, what's he showing here is it's not just that he's got one car or two cars. He's got like different, he's got cars, he's got race cars, trucks, uh, uh, you know, uh, this uh, looks like a cement truck, uh, a front loader, basically everything to do with uh, ground transportation. Okay. So he's playing with these toys and then this is what happens. So the camera starts to pan out and this pattern on the carpet uh, starts to emerge into view. And if you look at these patterns, they're sort of uh, one, two, three, hexagonal, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six sided. Okay, so they're like hexagons and uh, with uh, a pointy, okay, let's pan out a little bit more. This will become more important, okay? When you look at these uh, pointed, uh, they look like rockets or missiles, especially this will become more clear when the camera pans out even more. These things uh, in the, the the pointed end uh, in the carpet, you know, they're, they're pointing in both directions, one towards us and one going away from the, from the viewer. And then suddenly this ball comes rolling in, okay? Now, if this really was as uh, many people contend, the Stanley Kubrick confessing that he was the one that faked the, the Apollo 11 videos to deceive people into thinking that we actually went to the moon, then I'm sure that he would also know the reason why he was faking it, and this would be his hint at throwing this ball. Okay, basically he is showing you that... Uh, as we will look at this room in its completeness, which will come into view soon, that this is where this boy is. That the world he lives in is, is an enclosed space, okay? But what he is shown is a ball. He's a young boy, so essentially he is, Stanley Kubrick is pointing out that from a very young age, 
almost from birth, this indoctrination begins about the ball earth, the ball, the, the, the blue marble, the globe, the sphere, the rotundity, you know, that, that is implanted into our minds almost from the moment we step out of the womb. Okay, let's uh, play it a little bit more here. Okay, now the camera shows us this corridor. Now, if you look at this corridor, what we are seeing here is these, again, if you look at the bottom of the screen, this looks like a whole set of rockets or missiles coming this way and going the opposite way. What's so significant about this pattern is that these missiles or these rockets, they are flying horizontally. Okay, and what the significance of that is, I will point out later, but I believe there is significance in that. But this space that this boy is in, if that represents our world, it is an enclosed space. See, there are walls around it, there's a ceiling on top, and there is only one exit here, which you can see on his right side. So the exit is through this door, but not through the ceiling, okay? and certainly not through the walls. All right, so he's going to stand up now. And as he stands up, the camera is going to focus in on the sweater that he is wearing, which is really significant. Ah. Okay, so this boy stands up and he has been shown the ball and now he is also shown something else, or at least the audience is shown. What does it say? Is not, I mean, if this is a hint, it's not even a hint, it's like right in your face. The sweater says Apollo not just any Apollo, because there were 17 Apollo missions. This one says Apollo 11 USA. So again, Stanley is drawing our attention to Apollo 11. Why? Is it just like happened that they had this sweater lying around? But when you take everything into context and you see the other signs that are related to the moon landing, of Apollo 11, then it'll become understandable that this is not an accident. He is definitely pointing. It is, he's really showing us, look at this, look at this kid's sweater, look what he is saying to you. So it says Apollo 11. Okay, this, the rocket is pointing straight up towards this, but it cannot go up because there is a ceiling that is going to stop it, okay? So now this kid starts walking down this corridor. Ah. And then we see all the doors are closed, except this one door. And this one door, you know, it starts coming into focus. And it focuses in on the room number. You can see that here, red keychain. Red, of course, is the color of danger, right? And then the number on here is 237. By the way, in Stephen King's book, the room number was 217, and Stanley Kubrick changed that to 237. Do we think there's some significance in it? Well, it just happens that the moon is supposedly 237,000 miles away from the Earth, okay? So here's this kid with the Apollo 11, and they're going to travel 237 miles and go up to the moon. But, do they? Um, are you there? Those who know the story of The Shining, okay? Those who know, those who watched the movie, if you haven't, you should watch it. It needs some careful watching to see all these things. And there is actually a documentary called Room 237, which brings out a lot of the hidden messages that are contained in that movie. Okay, so what that room signifies 
is something very monstrous. There's a monstrous truth hiding in that room. And what that truth is, that there's this, literally this putrefied, stinking, rotten, monstrous creature that was very good to look at on the surface in the beginning, but when the true picture emerged, it was really a horror, horror, like, you know, uh, uh, it, it was it was a horror, a room of horrors in which blood had been shed. So it was, there was a monstrous truth that was hidden in this room. Okay. So what Stanley, I believe, was trying to point out to us or trying to signify was that Yes, this moon mission was not real. It was a made-for-television event. Okay, they didn't go anywhere. These were all shot in the studio. Many people say they were shot at Disney Studios. Totally believable. And these films were shot there. And if you watch the... Which I will probably play that clip in my next part of this series the the uh, the press conference with the three astronauts uh, you know uh, Neil Armstrong uh, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins they look like they were at a funeral can you imagine that you know have you seen like when guys win the Super Bowl or the World Series or something and they go to a press conference can you see their faces beaming from ear to smiling from ear to ear? And they are jumping and hooping it up and just over the moon? No pun intended. Well, maybe it is intended. But in this case of this this, this conference, the first one, they really look like they were shell-shocked. Okay? And it's worth watching their reaction. A guy like Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, that man should have been president. But they tucked him away. Okay, he hasn't even given any on-camera interviews. Can you believe that? You know, he should have been the biggest celebrity of the 20th century. But no, sorry, he just went and hid in the shadows. What does that mean? Well, well, obviously what it means is that there was no moon mission. That's what it means. Okay, so this idea that is coming through here is that this is not just something to do with money, okay? That NASA is going to make a lot of money, but uh, they couldn't really go to the moon, so they faked it. There is something bigger here, which has to do with our very existence, okay? Which is to do with the fundamental nature of reality. That's what it is about, that going down that path, these myths and fictions that are presented to us, like that ball that came rolling down, which represents the globe Earth, and this fiction that, yes, you know, we can go and touch the stars and go to infinity and beyond. No, for certain reasons, it is not possible, and therefore, there is a motivation in some power or powers wanting you to believe that. And it is in that fiction there is something monstrous which is seeking to devour something very precious that you have. Okay? That's what I see here. And I will go into that a little bit later in this in these series as to what I think is actually why this is significant if the Earth is really not a globe and uh, the, it does not revolve around the sun, but rather the heavens themselves revolve around the Earth. What is the significance of that? It is just something that we should find out out of moot curiosity or there is something much bigger at stake here. Before I finish off, I want to point something out to you. In Isaiah chapter 14 in the Old Testament of the Bible, there is a story of this creature called Lucifer, 
Now, I'm sure everybody has heard the name of Lucifer. And with Lucifer, this, his story goes something like this. That Lucifer wanted to dethrone God and take his place. So Lucifer says certain things which are recorded in Isaiah chapter 14. He says, I will ascend into heaven. I will set my throne above the stars of God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will also sit upon the sides of the north or the, in the congregation in the sides of the north. And finally, I will be like the most high. What I want to bring it back to is one part of these five things that he said, which was, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. But how did the story of Lucifer begin in Isaiah? It began thus. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Okay, we have all heard that these men and these people, these powers that be, they are Luciferians. And they would have us to believe that they are going to conquer the so-called space, that they are going to infinity and beyond, which means they are going into heaven itself. Whereas their father didn't even make it above the heights of the clouds. That's a very significant information in there. That he was not able to ascend above the heights of the cloud, which means he was not able to break our atmosphere. The conclusion we draw from that is that for whatever reason, which I will go into later on, it is not possible to go above the atmosphere. They tell us that the atmosphere only rises up to 100 miles or so. I don't believe it. But I will elaborate on that in the next part of this series. And secondly, I also wanted to draw your attention to another story in the Bible, which is the story of the Tower of Babel. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 11. And it tells us that there was this group led, led by Nimrod, the first emperor on the earth after the flood of Noah. And they were going to build themselves this tower whose top would reach into heaven. Well, that didn't quite pan out either. So in these two instances where these creatures wanted to ascend into the heavens, their attempts ended in abject failure. So what do you think? That that which Lucifer couldn't do, his Luciferian followers are going to do? Anyhow, I just want to finish off now by saying that uh, I will come back to the story of Lucifer because I believe it's a very significant one. And also in regards to Satan, uh, Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. It seems like the Bible indicates that whenever man or anybody from the earth has attempted to rise up to the heavens, Jesus said, no man has ascended into heaven. Okay, those, those attempts have met with failure. So I am now of the opinion that it is not possible to break the earth's atmosphere which rises much higher than what NASA would have us believe. And therefore, this whole idea of space and infinite uh, galaxies and all that, this is a very carefully crafted fiction, but there's a purpose and a reason for this, which uh, again was alluded to in this program, but I will elaborate on this later. Thank you for listening. This is Paul Sandhu.
broken secrets we're hiding We all feel the pain All alone we've been crying But we can't find our way Jesus, show us the way out of the darkness. The little games we play. Darkness to blind us In our graves we lay Wondering how they could find us But we can't find our way Speak my name 